if one's fear is too much, if one shows an excessive fear of the devil, then that in and of itself puts one in a relationship with him. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, bless Hi, thanks for tuning in to Armor of God. Well, as always, let me start the video by saying thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video, and hopefully you'll learn a lot from what we've put together for you here. And so for this video, my apology in advance because we're going to talk a little bit more about the demons here again. I do not want us to focus too much on the devil, but rather as I've always said in the past, to get rid of any confusion about this very subject. And that's why I share that clip of Father Carlos Martins at the start of this video. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. Let me kick this off with something from Father Carlos Martins. You have demons that you can definitely tell they're a low-ranking demon, a peon. There's not always multiple demons, but where there are, you can bet that the first one to come out is not the boss because the main possessing demon protects himself by inviting other demons in. And he brings them in through establishing greater covenants with the victim by opening more doors, if you will. And then when there is the confrontation with the priest, the lower ranking ones, the foot soldiers, those are the ones that are sent out first. An exorcist can approach that two ways. He can immediately ask for the boss. But oftentimes, for at least the first foot soldier, I will choose to interact with them to kind of get a feel of what's going on here. The low level ones often have a great chip on their shoulder. They're on the bottom of the totem pole. They're taking orders and probably their entire existence consists of just that, constantly taking orders. But you have to remember a demon by nature is proud and resents that. So even though he's part of this demonic network united against God, and they're just preying upon this victim like parasites without any mercy, they resent each other. I will often access that resentment, and occasionally I get him to give up information that he ordinarily would not. And usually if he does, a higher ranking demon will snatch him out and will manifest himself. When you have a higher ranking demon, he typically displays less pride than a lower ranking demon, and he's less anxious to establish his authority. He possesses authority, and he knows that he does. When I've handled enough lower ranking demons, I've managed to extract some information, but I've kind of just had enough. Then as a new demon comes out, all right, I want your boss. I don't want to talk with you. Lord. I ask you to bring out the main possessor, or at least the demon that you want me to deal with now. And there will be a new demon that always comes out at that point. This is one where there's going to be a lot more resistance exhibited by him and a lot less showboating. There are typically less displays of power. The lower ranking demons are the ones that are, in my experience, very glad to display their power because they want to make themselves out to be important. When in fact, even in the demonic kingdom, they're not very important. They're a kind of a stopgap. And then there's an interview done by Father Robert Spitzer that I'd like to share with you on the three level of deception by the devil, which I hope will be useful for you. I mean, uh, the devil uses fear on three levels. And I mean, the, the first level the devil wants to, to, to use is God's not here to protect you. It's just you and me to duke it out. And don't sucker for that, mm -hmm. right? I mean, the minute you, you begin to believe that, just start saying the prayer of St. Michael immediately, mm -hmm. right? You know, uh, St. Michael the Archangel, protect me, Mother Mary, protect me. In the name of Jesus, be gone, Satan. That's the end of it. Mm -hmm. That and and that is so long as you can't be talked out of saying God's not here, Saint Michael's not here, Mother Mary's not here. If if you can't be undermined in that mm -hmm. confidence, he can't use that anymore. Right. So you got to go to another level of fear. And the next level of fear is 
boy, oh boy, Spitzer, you are very <laughs> sinful indeed. And of course, I mean, no one knows your sin like I know your sin. <laughs> right. And I'm telling you right now, you are not worthy of, of the collar you wear. You are not worthy uh, to be called a priest. Boy, can I enumerate your imperfections, <laughs> right? And of course you start getting, right, immediately, you, you know yourself, you say, I do have those imperfections. But in God's mercy, He's not only forgiven us if we have asked him sincerely for forgiveness, he's not only forgiven us, he's already healing us. He's already entering into us. He's already working, right? He's already working through our faults to actually bring us to a higher level than where we were before. So what we have to remember is, hey, we are imperfect. However, God is making us worthy for him. We're not making ourselves worthy. He's basically right. helping us, healing us, uh, forgiving us, showing us his mercy. Despair itself, to lose hope. And that's where what the, the devil finally says is, not that you're just imperfect. You know, what, who are you to contend with me, mm -hmm. you little, you know, peon? He says instead, you're so imperfect, no one can love you, not even God. Mm -hmm. And of course, what he's going to do is exactly what the Holy Father says. He's going to try and convince you God's love is not unconditional. Wow. He's going to try and convince you that God's love is not infinite. Therefore, your sinfulness mm -hmm. can be darker than God's light. That's how he's going to convince you. And then once he's got you in the grip of that, you know how it is with the eros of death, right? Mm -hmm. After a while, you start spinning downward, mm -hmm. right? Where you, all of a sudden you just say, you know, I give up. Right. You know, I can't do it myself. Of course we can't right. do it ourselves. This is the ultimate deception. Right. We can't do it ourselves. But he's going to say right. to you, you know, it's all over for you. Anyway, now before I share a few more clips, there's something that I'd like to explain, seeing that there are a lot of our Protestant brothers and sisters watching the videos here. As I'm sure a lot of you are aware, many non-Catholics struggle with the concept of praying to saints because they think prayer and worship are the same thing. Since the Bible says we should only worship God, then shouldn't we only pray to God? But here's the thing. The word worship refers to giving the honor that person is due. We call judges your honor, for example, as a way of paying them respect, but we don't treat them like gods. Prayer comes from the Latin word precarious and refers to making a request for something. In Old English, a person might have said to a friend, I pray you will join us for dinner tomorrow night. They aren't worshiping their friend as a god, but simply making a request of them. Catholics do the same thing when they pray to saints. They don't honor them as gods, but ask them for their prayers. And this brings us to another question, one that is frequently asked by non-Catholics. Why should we ask saints in heaven to pray for us when we can just pray to God instead? After all, in the scripture it says, For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, Jesus Christ. Catholics agree that it is great to pray directly to God, but if this argument were taken to its logical conclusion, then it would forbid asking anyone on earth to pray for us. It doesn't make sense to say Christians who are in heaven are some kind of amputated part of Christ's body that cannot pray for any of the other parts. Jesus calls himself the vine and says we are the branches. If Jesus holds the keys of death, then how could death ever separate the branches from one another as long as they are all spiritually connected to the same vine? Jesus himself said that God is not the God of the dead, but of the living and to write off saints like them as being dead ignores the fact that, by virtue of their heavenly union with Christ, they are more alive than they were on earth. Well, I hope that helps. If you'd like to ask any more questions regarding that, please don't hesitate to ask in the comment section below. And now, I've shared several times before where these priests talking about the hierarchy of demons, but the way Father Martin's explain it here is really interesting. Prayer is poison to a demon. You're using prayer in order to weaken his hold, to get him to surrender information, and then ultimately to cast him out. So in the course of his receiving that punishment, one of the things he's going to try to do is, unbeknownst to you, he's going to summon another demon and have that demon take his place. Now you're fighting a brand new demon, one who's fresh, so now you're wasting your energy, so to speak, because you can't take advantage of the weakness in the demon that has just switched out. 
how you become aware of that typically, you have to consider that every demon has a personality, just like humans do. They reveal themselves in the way that they animate this particular body. So there'll be contortion within the muscles in a particular way. And so that's your clue. That's the biggest clue. Okay, there's a change here. This is a new demon. He may speak differently, and he's going to try to sound and act like the first demon so that you won't know that there's been a switch. It's to their advantage. But when you perceive it, then you want to say, no, no, no. I didn't give permission for that first demon to leave. God Almighty, I ask that you bring that first demon, and you typically name him if you know his name, bring him back now and get rid of this second demon. And then you can continue where it leaves off. It's important as an exorcist that you only allow a demon to leave when you want that to happen. By leave, what I mean is leave the sphere of the attention because then he's out of the immediate strike range of your prayers. And just for the sake of comparing two different sources, let's hear how Father Vincent Lampert puts it instead. So I've worked with people who tell me that once the demon manifests in their body, they no longer have any recollection of what took place. Others have told me that once the manifestation begins, then they're aware of everything that's happening, but they're like a prisoner trapped in their own body, helpless to stop any of it. The church would say that, you know, just as much as there is a hierarchy in the angelic world, there is a hierarchy in the demonic world. So they vary in strength and malice, maybe according to the height from which they fell. Certainly, the highest ranking of the angels that fell was Lucifer himself, who became the devil or Satan, and then all of the other angels would kind of fall below him. But there is a hierarchy in the demonic world, and it really is a matter of trying to understand what ranking of demon that I may be dealing with. And it is true that oftentimes it isn't a question of one demon, but it could be multiple demons kind of clustered together with a demon of a higher ranking that's kind of controlling the possession itself. Some of you might remember Monsignor Rossetti once shared during an interview that the demons hate each other. And again, just to compare, here's what Father Lampert has to say about it. There is no fraternity or collegiality amongst demons. They hate themselves just as much as they hate us, but they are united in their hatred of humanity. What's the old line, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So demons, again, there's no fraternity there, if you will, but they are united. And oftentimes the weakest demons are the first to go, but they're even, you know, kind of conflicted because they want to leave, but maybe the higher ranking demon is trying to force them to stay which leads to even greater torment for them. So it is a great, crazy, chaotic, dysfunctional world with the demons. If there's one thing that I've learned after listening to these exorcists sharing some of their cases, I come to realize the sad reality that some parents are truly evil in that they are willing to consecrate their children to the devil. We've heard Father Lampert talking about it before, as well as Father John Sada, Father Ripperger, and Father Daniel Rehill. But for this video, I'll share something from Father Martin's instead. I had a possession case of someone who was born into a satanic cult. This poor victim was possessed not because anything that she had done herself, but because her very parents consecrated her to evil from the time she was in the womb. She was tortured horrifically by her parents and by the other cult members in order to make of her an offering to demons. So this victim had side by side with this demonic affliction, an incredible amount of post-traumatic stress disorder. And so in one of the sessions, I brought with me a hair of the founder of my religious community, the Companions of the Cross, founded in 1985 by Father Bob Bedard. Father Bob was a holy person. I have no doubt that he is a saint. He is not yet formally canonized, but the process of canonization in the Catholic Church adds nothing to somebody's holiness. It's merely the formal recognition of holiness. And during his life one time, while he was alive, I was talking with him, and on the rim of his glasses, there was a hair, a loose hair of his had fallen on the rim. And so I say, hey, Father Bob, just, you got a hair here on your glass, let me just get rid of it for you. 
So I took it from him and pretended to kind of toss it onto the floor, but I kept my fingers pressing on it because I wanted to keep this as a relic of his. So I dug out this hair of Father Bob's and goodness, the demons just howled. It caused an incredible amount of torment to them. The first one screamed out, get him off of me, get him off of me. And he would say over and over again, I hate you. I hate you as he was staring at this hair. Father Bob's relic had such a profound effect because he himself was a victim of post-traumatic stress disorder. In addition to being a priest, he was a teacher in a Catholic high school run by the Archdiocese of Ottawa in Canada. And in the early 1970s, there was a school shooting in his classroom. There were students that were shot in front of Father Bob. The trauma of that, it afflicted him acutely. He had great trouble sleeping and he never talked about it. You could talk to Father Bob about anything, but we just knew not to go there. And so to this person here, whose life had been so characterized by trauma, his relic was profoundly effective as a help to that person. And just one more from Father Carlos Martins, where he shared the case in which he battled one of the strongest demons he ever encountered during an exorcism. Years ago, I was given a folded paper envelope, very small, maybe one inch by three inches, that encased within it was an alleged thread from the Shroud of Turin. It's impossible to know through scientific means whether this is the actual burial cloth of Jesus. All science can do is corroborate that there's a probability that this could be the cloth. I personally believe that that cloth is the actual burial cloth of Jesus, but I believe so because of the evidence. And I know one of the researchers, Dr. John Jackson, who headed the Shroud of Turin research project in the 1970s for NASA. I've read his research and I'm convinced by what he's discovered. So I received this alleged fragment of the Shroud of Turin, and there are very few because the Shroud of Turin has not been divided like other relics have been, but it was a long thread. It was about two inches long. And in terms of the Shroud of Turin, this is a pretty large relic. So I brought it to Dr. Jackson and even just eyeballing it, I could tell that his eyes lit up. And so I left it with him for several weeks and he wrote a report on it, which his conclusion is that, yes, this is a relic of the Shroud of Turin. So I took this relic with me to an exorcism and this person had an immensely strong demon, which I had battled for years, who identified himself as Satan. Is this the Satan? I don't know, but he is easily the strongest demon that I've ever encountered. So when I pulled out this relic of the Shroud of Turin and I placed it up against the back of the demon, the demon brought his knees together and feet together, brought his right wrist over his left wrist and exhibited the same position of the man in the shroud as if the demon was compelled to mimic the position of our Lord's body in the tomb prior to the resurrection. The demon stopped all resistance and began to whimper, a quiet whimper. It had now encountered something that was controlling it in every manner. The Shroud of Turin, it's a relic that is just so rare that I was skeptical that it was authentic, but that skepticism is now non-existent completely. The testimony of the demons bodes to the holiness of this relic and to its authenticity. And here's another one from Father Vincent Lampert. Usually weaker demons don't really have a proper name. They might say that there is a, you know, the demon of anger or gluttony or lust. Think of any of the, the deadly sins. The ones of a higher ranking seem to have a proper name. So like I mentioned earlier, casting out the demon Leviathan, in that person, they were, they were possessed by seven demons and they were kind of, you know, working together. You know, in the gospel accounts, when demons speak to Jesus, they always go and speak from the, in the singular to the plural. 
such as, I know who you are, the Holy One of God, have you come against us before the present time? So again, and these weakest demons, they're, they're always the first to go. The ones of a higher ranking like Leviathan told me that it had a right to possess this person because the person had done something that gave the demon authority to possess them. But the human person has the capacity to grow in holiness and virtue. We can say, well, that was a really dumb thing to do. And then we can repent and want to change. Demons may try to convince us that, no, it's one and done, but that's certainly not the case. So anyone can ask for help in having demons cast out. It's important to note that just because somebody is possessed doesn't mean that they're manifesting 24 hours a day. To be possessed means that somehow the person, either directly or indirectly, gave authority to a demon to attach itself to their life. They enter into them, if you will, and then something may trigger that demonic connection that causes a manifestation. The people who are possessed can go through the normal aspects of life. They can go to work and school and do these types of things, but then something will trigger the manifestation. And because they're not manifesting all the time, then the person can ask for help from the church. No exorcisms cannot be performed on anyone against their will. The person has to ask for the help of the church. And as a priest, I don't go around trying to drum up business and telling people, hey, you're possessed, you need an exorcism. No, it's the people who reach out to me who believe that that's the case, and then I have a very strict protocol that I will follow to make the determination whether or not their situation is demonic in nature, is it spiritual, is it physical due to a medical condition, or is it mental due to some type of, you know, psychotic whatever that may be going on in the person. Well then, for the last part of this video, I'd like to share a beautiful message from Monsignor Stephen Rossetti, and it's about something that matters the most, which is loving Jesus. In a recent exorcism, I mentioned to the possessed person the name of Jesus. And when I said it, she just said, oh, she said the demons hate that name. It makes them very angry every time you say it. And she said, it hurts, it hurts just, just to hear that name. Demons hate Jesus. They even hate the mention of his name. But we as Christians are called to love Jesus. My question to you, do you love Jesus? Do you remember Pope Benedict's last words before he died very recently? He said, Jesus, I love you. A very saintly thing to say on one's deathbed. I'm often struck by who was at the cross of Jesus. The, the Bible tells us who, were, who was there when Jesus was crucified. We know especially Mary Magdala, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Jesus, and the disciple John. <clears throat> what did they have in common? They loved Jesus. His mother loved Jesus, her son, of course. Mary Magdalene had a special love of Jesus. And John, of course, the beloved disciple who had intense love of Jesus. So the fear of being there, of being seen with Jesus, who was killed as an insurrectionist, matter of fact, the fear was so great uh, in, in St. Peter that initially he denied Jesus. No, I don't know him. He did not want to be, be associated with a criminal. But John loved Jesus. Mary Magdalene loved Jesus. Mary, the mother of Jesus, loved Jesus, her son. They loved him so much, they would have endured anything. They had to be there at his crucifixion. And later when St. Peter was redeemed uh, by Jesus, what did Jesus ask of this first Pope, this first leader of the church? Simon Peter, do you love me? That's what Jesus wants from us. He wants us to love him. Now. How can we do this? We say because sometimes it might feel difficult because it doesn't feel like Jesus is close to us. This love of Jesus comes to us by the power of the Spirit. It's a gift. It's a gift. The saints had this, this incredible love of Jesus. So now I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit comes upon you and gives you this great grace that you might love Jesus. So let us pray. 
I pray that Mary, the mother of God, will intercede for all of us, that we might come to love Jesus as she loved Jesus. May the power of the Holy Spirit infuse our hearts and our minds. May we be filled with the powerful love of Jesus. May the light of Christ shine in us, filling us with that love. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. And may Almighty God bless you. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Well, then that is all for the video this time. I sincerely hope you've learned a lot from this video. And if there's any feedback or suggestion, please don't hesitate to let me know in the comments below. Anyway, for those of you who'd like to support our works, I left a link to our PayPal donation down in the description box below. And as always, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for your continuous support, prayer, and contribution. Until the next time, stay safe, stay healthy, and God be with you.